Welcome everyone. This is Privacy Conversations, uh, the uh, Dan and Justin show. Um, uh, I'm Daniel Solov, I'm a law professor at GW Law School. Uh, I'm joined with, by Justin and Tony Play of Wirewheel. And uh, today we have a terrific guest on, Andy Dale. Um, Andy is general counsel at Alice, and he's had a very long and distinguished career in privacy law. So welcome, Andy, and uh, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Justin. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Justin, I want to kick it over to you. Um, you have some thoughts on uh, a very big case that's going to uh, be coming down next week. Yeah, well, first of all, uh, great to see you both. Dan, great to see you as always. Andy, welcome to the show. Um, and uh, Andy, obviously, you've been a longtime practitioner in the privacy world, and you also convene a lot of the leaders in the MarTech world around privacy. So uh, Dan and I were uh, very excited to have you on uh, today for a couple of different reasons. Um, I'm going to talk in a minute uh, about the Schrems 2 decision that's teed up for next Thursday. Uh, but since you're our guest today, uh, Andy, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and tell us a little bit about Alice. Um, but obviously, um, one of the things that's critically on the minds of folks around the country and companies all over uh, the country right now is CCPA now being enforced by the Attorney General in California covers a lot of companies, a lot of companies who may not know uh, even that they're covered. And so we'll come back to this in a moment, but um, Andy, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and Alice, and then we'll come back to some of these uh, CCPA questions. Thanks for having me, appreciate that. Um, yeah, so I fell backwards into privacy like a lot of people do. I was on the team at the legal team at TD Ameritrade, and uh, the only person I knew that had a privacy certification was my boss, our chief privacy officer. So a lot of things have changed since then. Um, and when I left TD Ameritrade, I went to an advertising technology company. And on the way out, he said to me, uh, you're going to have a lot of privacy issues there. And I said, what do you mean? It's just browser cookies. And boy, was I wrong. <laughs> so when I when I arrived at an advertising tech company, I quickly realized how relevant and important privacy was. And that became a big focal point for what I was doing there. So I was the attorney at that company for four years um, and then moved over to a company called Session M, which was more in the marketing tech space and the loyalty and data programs. And in October of 2019, we sold the company to MasterCard. And now uh, after working on the integration of those two companies, I've joined Alice, which is another marketing tech company. Um, so that's that's sort of my niche. But luckily for me, there's a ton of privacy issues in that niche. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited to discuss CCPA with you both. I think it'll be interesting uh, to see where things go with enforcement. And so uh, there's a lot to talk about here for sure. Well, that that's great. And, uh, you know, as we were talking about before we came online, one of the one of the first things that so many companies are focused on right now, because it's one of the first things you see when you come to any company's website, is this requirement under CCPA of just-in-time notices, plain and readable, plain language privacy information. Um, tell us what you're seeing there. Tell us what you're worried about. And how should companies be really focused on this right now mm -hmm. as, as the attorney general is going to enforce? It's interesting because we're all familiar with privacy by design from, you know, our, our, our privacy practice and from the GDPR and, and the CCPA having uh, a requirement that your privacy policy be a little bit more readable and understandable is really interesting to me, um, particularly as I'm rewriting ours right now and, and joining the company and kind of taking another look at it. Um, Alice had a nice brand already, a very like accessible brand. Um, and so now what I'm trying to do is trying to take uh, the, the CCPA's requirements and put them into our voice and try to do that in a way that makes the privacy policy more accessible and more and more readable to consumers, which I think is really, really, really proven over the years not to be so easy. And I've seen uh, many, many uh, companies do, do uh, make attempts at it. And so 
um, it's an interesting time as I try to figure it out. And I have examples that I've looked at over the years. And as you mentioned, Justin, we have a nice circle of GCs and privacy people that are able to talk about these things with each other to kind of bounce ideas off of one another. And this is a topic that always comes up. How do we make these things you know, less legalese and more just straight to the point? Because we really should be talking to consumers about what's happening with their data. It, 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 it's not a secret. So, so how do you do with it? There's a big problem or a big challenge that I see with privacy policies, which is on the one hand, you want the policies to be understandable to the consumer. You want them to be short and very succinct. Uh, on the other hand, privacy is very complicated uh, and security is very complicated. Uh, so how, you know, to get the policies to say something meaningful um, with enough detail to actually get into it, but without um, overwhelming the consumer with information they really don't understand. And I, I found that, you know, that's actually a really tricky challenge uh, to make something that is consumer friendly, but at the same time, you know, substantively meaningful uh, so that the consumer gets details that are meaningful, not just a bunch of icons. Um, I don't know if you've delve that far into it, but you know, that, I have a couple that's a trick to a couple thoughts on that. Um, uh, at, at Session M, we we took this approach with our employee handbook, which was an is another type of another of these types of documents that are, are long and inclusive, uh, have a lot of things in them that aren't always clear to people. So our approach with the handbook was let's completely flip this on its head and let's have the marketing team write it. So first we took a draft through, we, we, I made it, I made it, uh, I put everything in there that I felt needed to be in there. And then we, it was a deep collaboration with our marketing team on what it should look like. And it was nice because there was push and pull. There was, you know, brand against legal and sort of, you know, all, all done in a collaborative way. And so I think we need to take a very similar approach on privacy policies. I think you need your design team involved. You need your branding team involved. You need your marketing team involved. They need to be the ones checking you and saying, this statement about flash cookies makes no sense to me. So I need it to be much more clear what it is, or I don't care about this part so much. I care more about this part. And what's really important is, is I think look and feel in, in tech terms, UI UX of privacy. Um, it, it's a time, it's an opportunity for us to innovate. And I don't think enough people are, are thinking about it necessarily that way. I think they're thinking, got to update it for CCPA, got to put certain things in there and got to disclose categories and, and, and make, um, make it look a little bit nicer or clearer for people. But they're not, I don't think they're going the extra mile. And that's our intent to do that. Yeah, back in the days when when people flew, um, I remember there was one airline that bucked the trend and created a actually a fun, watchable airline safety video, uh, and it had humor in it. Um, I think it had a Lord of the Rings theme to it, um, but it was entertaining and and witty and funny and actually you know something that people paid attention to. Uh, I think in the the privacy policy world, you know, privacy policies are you know not the most exciting bit of reading. Uh, so consumers- You don't think so, Dan? You don't think people are setting aside a, a week Dan, some of through privacy policies? Dan, you do some of this already in the sense that you create visuals to explain complex regulations. And so it's that type of thinking that we need to apply to privacy policies. Yeah, and, and you know, Andy, when we've gone through this, you know, we, we've spent a lot of time, as you say, on the privacy user experience. How do we enable you know, companies to be able to tell that story in a beautiful, interesting, more comprehensible way? You know, one of the things when we've been doing our own and ours is published, obviously, on the website, the places where we've just to be, you know, one turn specific about what you were talking about. When we're talking about the, the hardest parts we've had on the substance have been on making what we're collecting, like the observable logged information, really understandable. Because when you get into things like how the cookies and what information is being collected, what's being collected or logged, that can really be complex. And, and explaining it in plain English is hard. And then there are parts, for example, of CCPA that are honestly just legal-ish. For example, what is a sale of data under CCPA? 
And you could end up writing five paragraphs explaining whether what you're doing qualifies as a sale or doesn't qualify as a sale. And we've almost put up, and we have put up language that says, as people use the word sale, we don't use, we don't sell your data. But there are legal interpretations that qualify stuff that is not a sale as a sale of data. And some of the stuff we're using, which we explained below, could qualify, right? That's an attempt at plain language, almost trying to be funny, yeah. like Dan says, but it, it starts to have a catch-22 quality about it. I'm laughing. I'm laughing because that was my my immediate take when I first read the CCPA and read the sale portions of the CCPA. So I went right to thinking, how are we going to draft this into a privacy policy? And and we're going to have to definitely talk about, well, <laughs> what is a sale in your life? And what is a sale in this context? And we're going to have to really talk about this in the privacy policy for sure. So I think it's going to be really interesting to see who takes what approach in talking about sale and talking about, as you said, complex te technological issues. One of the companies that's done a really nice job um, at working on their privacy policy is Twitter. If you look at Twitter and Microsoft, but if you look at both of those privacy policies, they've made concerted efforts. You can you can see them visually where they, they, they create a, a user experience that is is you know focused and drops you into certain segments of the privacy policy lets you know exactly what those sections are for i think some of it is some of it is just that it's it's going to be technical no matter what but if i'm aware that i'm in a technical section that's that's almost in and of itself helpful okay i'm in a cookies section and i can judge how much i care about about cookies and what they're doing you know for advertising purposes at a device level versus the data that's being collected you know where this company is a controller or a, or a business no I, I completely agree and then you know you always have this thing in the back of your head you try to write it in plain language you try to do the right thing but are you going to be dinged for not doing what everybody else does and one of the things that's on a lot of minds of US folks is one of the first investigations that was really announced publicly in Europe was around um, Google's you know, disclosures and how they tried to break it up. And I, when you look at the, the back and forth, I, I don't know where that's gonna end up coming out ultimately in terms of a final fine or what, what action, but there you see a company trying, it looks like they're trying to break it up and give more, you know, sort of comprehensible information. And of course, that also was criticized. So it's, it's you know, it's hard. You have to do judgments. You have to, you have to just take some risks in this area right now, because there's not a very, very clear guide. And certainly with, with um, CCPA, I think if you're trying to do the right thing and trying to make it plain spoken, at least you have a shot at it, you know? Um, Agreed. I think as a smaller company, uh, you need to show that you've been focused on the issues, right? And that you've been thinking about it and that you made your choices for a reason. You have to sort of set Google aside because they have so many, um, so many other challenges outside of those that a small company does. Um, a small company, if you're going to, you're going to make these decisions, I agree, Justin, just be really thoughtful about them. Doc document them, you know, um, document your approach. And then if your approach is not, is not what a regulatory authority thinks it should be, be open, change it. Yeah, I totally agree. Well, look, uh, first of all, phenomenal to just talk about it. And I, I agree, we try to, you know, cover a couple of subjects. So the other one that Dan put on the table, that's a big one for us to all at least talk about a little bit is Shrems 2. So this is really moving from privacy policies to some of the international uh, issues going on. And I thought I would frame this up a little bit because um, it's on the minds of so many larger companies, or if you're a company that has business in Europe and you're worried about the movement of data, um, this is a decision you're probably paying some attention to. So just to frame this issue up, uh, Schrems 2 is the follow-up to the first Schrems decision. And the first Schrems decision was uh, is quite well known because it invalidated what was called the safe harbor framework. And it led to the privacy shield coming out the following year, which of course I spent a lot of time on years ago. Um, and Schrems 2 
is focused on a second way in which data can leave uh, Europe. So the framing of a lot of these cases is <clears throat> based on the following. Under uh, European law, the GDPR, data as a general matter has to stay in Europe. And that's a weird concept, right? Even if you think about it, Andy and Dan, right? Most of the time when we're thinking about data, and you go to any of our companies and you say, hey, your data has to stay and be processed in Europe absent some ability to move it. It seems very counterintuitive, but the default in European law is data has to stay in Europe unless you have a basis to transfer the data out of Europe. And those bases that are allowed in European law include things like what are called standard contractual clauses or uh, binding corporate rules. Those are specifically provided for, or you have something like an approved adequacy mechanism, like what Privacy Shield is, or something that's called another derogation or another reason that enables you to move the data out. So that's the broad framework, is generally the data has to stay in Europe unless you have a way to transfer it out. So in SHREMS 2, um, Max SHREMS, challenged one of those transfer mechanisms against Facebook, and that transfer mechanism is called standard contractual clauses. And the way this roughly works is, when you're in Europe, you're doing business usually with uh, Facebook Ireland, where Facebook is based. So when you do, you know, you log into Facebook, you're probably transferring your data in the first instance to Ireland's Facebook instance. But then of course, uh, Facebook might be transferring that data to its servers in the US. And so they put a stand, what's called standard contractual clauses in a relationship between Facebook Ireland, Facebook US. And what Max Schrems is arguing fundamentally is that that method of approving the transfer of data from Europe to the United States is invalid. That's what he's saying. Um, and he made a couple of claims about this. Uh, the core of his argument is because when Facebook transfers that data to the US, it's subject to say national security or intelligence co uh, collection. And because Max Schrems does not believe that the way a European person can challenge collection for those purposes is the same or essentially equivalent to what's in Europe, his challenge is that must mean that all standard contractual clauses are effectively invalid. And um, I'm not gonna go on, I, I, I suspect I could bore you both, but it's a very important case or could be. Um, and the decision has been teed up to come out in the US late in the evening on Thursday, next Thursday the 16th going into uh, the 17th. Um, there, are, there are in fact, possibilities in this case that could be quite difficult for all companies all over the world. Um, and what I mean by that is, if the European Court of Justice has language in their decision that invalidates a standard contractual clause framework, and they have language in there about having to have a right to challenge US intelligence collection activities, in order to make standard contractual clauses valid, if, if all of those happens. So Andy, Dan, we're talking like eight ifs, and it would go into a lot of things that are you know, you know, pretty, pretty uh, out there, right? In terms of intelligence collection. So there's a lot of ifs in there, but I think a lot of the legal community is watching that case because um, in the Schrems 1 decision, there was a fair amount of language that went into this area. If it's extended in Schrems 2, there are scenarios that could make this a very meaningful case, uh, broadly speaking. And the only other thing I'll, I'll, I'll say about this one is, in Europe, um, ahead of the issuance of the decision, uh, the Attorney General, uh, the AG, actually publishes an opinion that is usually very influential on the court. And that opinion came out in um, December, January, so December last year going into January. 
And so part of the reason people are really paying attention to this case in the next few days, and then I'll pause, is in the opinion, the attorney general basically said, number one, standard contractual clauses are probably fine, um, but each company has to make a decision about when you're actually transferring data to a country under that standard contractual clauses, whether that country's regimes are like fundamentally okay under the standard contractual clauses, which puts a lot, you as a general counsel, Andy, can imagine how difficult that is. So anyway, I know I've covered a lot, but maybe I'll say this. It's a potentially very important decision. It's coming out on Thursday. Dan, Andy, we're gonna be doing a much deeper dive on this decision next Friday after the decision comes out with a group of phenomenal experts. Um, so we can cover this much more deeply, but that's why people are paying attention to Schrems too. So. Uh, yeah, it, 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 a bunch of things I think are very interesting about it. Um, first, in um, the, the standard contractual clauses it, it, it are the most commonly used method to transfer data to and from, you know, for, about people in the EU outside, to outside the EU. They are the main mechanism that is used. Um, only a handful of companies have VCRs. The process to get a VCR is incredibly time consuming, difficult and long. Uh, and the um, privacy shield is used, but ultimately um, I think the implications of this case could in fact uh, throw shadows on privacy shield. Um, the Schrems one decision, the first decision, I think by logical implication, you know, it, just following logic and the language of the court would lead to the invalidation of the, the standard contractual clauses. Ultimately, the big concern was, you know, you know, in light of um, the Snowden revelations, in light of the tremendous power of the U.S. government to engage in surveillance, um, and the very difficult time that people had to actually challenge that surveillance, uh, that this would um, uh, this is a big problem and and invalidated safe harbor for that purpose. The problem is that um, the doctrine really hasn't changed. You know, the Supreme Court has been very stubborn and still, uh, you know, though there's been a little bit of, I guess, a little bit of movement on their part. But generally speaking, under the third party doctrine of the Fourth Amendment, uh, even if you have a contract that promises your customers privacy, you know, the third party doctrine holds that people lack a reasonable expectation of privacy in information that third parties have about them, even if the third party has promised them privacy, if it's contractual promise. Um, so you can have a contract that says, you know, we you know, provide all these protections, but if the government goes after this information, subpoenas the information or, or, or gathers it in any means, um, there is very little protection that the Fourth Amendment affords. Um, and there's also a big difficulty challenging um, government surveillance. There was a case called Clapper uh, decided by the Supreme Court, uh, Amnesty International versus Clapper decided by the Supreme Court in 2013. Uh, a bunch of people thought that they were being surveilled by the NSA. Uh, they took a number of steps to avoid that surveillance, costly steps, like not use the phone and travel physically on the plane to speak to people. And they challenged this saying the violent surveillance violates our, our, our rights and violates the law. The court said, well, you can't prove that you're under surveillance. Um, prove it. Well, you know, the government knows the answer, but wouldn't say the answer. So they go, well, we can't prove it. We, we need the government to tell us if we are. And the government said, we're not going to tell. Uh, and the court said, well, good for the government. You know, you don't tell and they can't prove it. Uh, and your, your case is based on speculation and therefore we're dismissing it. And they said, well, we've lost money. We, we've spent that. And it's still, you can't manufacture standing by spending money to avoid what might be very likely surveillance. Um, now, it later turns out that, you know, the, the Snowden revelations show they probably were under surveillance. But this is the problem that, you know, someone trying to challenge this will face a very difficult time given Supreme Court precedent. Now, the Supreme Court has moved a little bit more on the third party doctrine in, in some recent cases like Carpenter, um, throwing some, you know, possibility that the 
court might be willing to move away from it. But we're still in a regime where it, 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 it's not clear that that things are great uh, and that the contractual clauses will, will solve it. On the other hand, pragmatically, this is what I find so interesting about this case, is that if they invalidate standard contractual clauses, uh, how do you do business with, with Europe? Uh, how do you do business with the EU? I mean, that's what I was going to add, Dan. It, it puts a tremendous amount of pressure on the data protection authorities in 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 e, the EU to to do something or to figure something out or to to work with BCR. You know, you you mentioned that it's, it's so time consuming. It's also very costly. Um, it's a very specialized thing. You need you know. As a general counsel, I, I even even someone who does this stuff, I would I would need outside counsel with expertise in this area to help me do it, and um, it would you know as you noted, like invalidate almost you know a large amount of contracts, <laughs> and so it's a it would be an, a gargantuan task to rewrite all of those, even if you knew how to rewrite them. You wouldn't know, and the other thing is BCRs would be under the same thing. The BCR is no not much stronger than the contract, so ultimately, it, it still wouldn't answer the problem, and that would mean Europe. I mean, sorry, the EU would not be able to do business and transfer data pretty much anywhere in the world. Um, uh, By the way, so, but uh, but so Dan, here's here's the things I would say. That what you've just covered is kind of the doomsday scenario, right? Well, it, the, the doomsday scenario is we have like five ifs in here, but but they're they're valid. They're very important. What what I what I think might be fun, and I know we're coming up on our end of our time today, but I'd I'd love to actually debate you sometime on just one or two points in there, right? Uh, and we can we can have some fun with this because the point I would debate is um, the, a lot of the third party doctrine, those cases are really interesting and standing and the third party doctrine and national security. I find those cases really interesting and they'd be fun to talk about. The one point you said is the natural extension of Schrems is invalidation. Um, and I'm, that's the part that I'd like to debate because I actually don't think Schrems legally you know, has that effect. There's a fair amount of dicta in Schrems just based on its holding. You are a professor, I, I read your stuff all the time, and you know that it's it's largely a procedural decision. It's almost like an APA decision saying there wasn't sufficient documentation around the original safe harbor decision. And by the way, here's some things you should cover. And I don't see it as quite so prescriptive. Um, and, and this whole concept of essential equivalence to me is really about you know, squaring the circle between two different legal regimes um, that I think is achievable. That's my view. And so I don't quite see it in those stark terms. Well, I, I don't think they're going to hold, you know, I, I think they will uphold the, the contracts just because pragmatism um, will probably prevail. The, the alternative would be a, a nightmare and, and yeah. wouldn't really be feasible. I do think that the court tends to write uh, in language, and, and, and all its decisions are, are, are like this, uh, in, in very, very broad uh, language that I think if you took it to its logical point, it would uh, do these things. Now, the court will probably not do that, uh, but I, I, that's, you know, in reading the Schrems 1 decision, um, I read that and I said, well, you know, if, if the court is right about the points of logic, it, it would strike down not just safe harbor, but also everything. Um, but obviously, I think the court, you know, kept it confined to safe harbor. And I think practically, it's not going to go that route. Um, it will find a way to distinguish it. Uh, it will find a way to back down. Uh, I, otherwise, I, I don't, how do you have commerce uh, between the EU and, and, and so many other countries? Uh, so I, I just think that they almost have to, but, you know, they obviously want to use a leverage. This is a leverage point to try to make a statement. I also think, too, that's interesting, just just time has elapsed between um, TREMS 1 and TREMS 2. We're further away from the, the wound that um, Europe felt from hearing about the Snowden disclosures. 
um, you know, a lot of the, the Snowden revelations and the reaction of the government at the time was basically um, kind of a, a screw you. Uh, we're going to do what we want to do. Um, and, you know, you know, chest pumping and, 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 and fist, you know, fists on the chest. Um, and I think that Europe didn't take kindly to the, uh, the reaction in the U S so I think there's a lot of, um, but I think a lot of diplomacy has happened since then. And, and, and I think the reaction has simmered down a little bit, but I think part of it was maybe a bit of a reaction to, you know, Hey, wait a second, slow down. You know, you know, we, you know, our citizens and people in the U have, have, you know, uh, our interests that, that should be stood up for. No, first of all, boy, are we going to have a lot to talk about after Shrems or after Shrems 2. And, and it would be fun. I guess my, what I was saying is let's pick this up. I know we always run out of time on our conversations. Uh, there's a lot more to talk about on this one, but my, my view is not only did we as a country engage in a lot of open diplomacy, right? And I, saw it, I watched it, and I think the engagement was important. It was true, open uh, sharing. But I'm not only looking at Schrems one from the, and, and saying um, pragmatically or, you know, as a result of diplomacy, I think even on the language of Schrems one, there's a fair argument and a fair finding, in fact, finding that our regimes are essentially equivalent. They're just different. It doesn't have to be identical. And the lack of the third, you know, the the standing argument that you made, I don't think on, on its face actually prevents the adequacy decision. But I have a feeling you and I should debate that, uh, and it would be fun, you know, to, to kind of take it there. Andy, I'm sorry to have driven you, know, sort of drawn you in to this uh, to the Shrems uh, discussion like this. This impacts me. I'm I'm happy to listen. I mean, <laughs> I hope it goes the way Dan described. <laughs> No, I think, I think it, for me if it doesn't. Yeah, but boy, it, it, and you're right, Dan and Andy. From my view, if they go the way that Dan says, I don't, I don't really see any um, transfer mechanism. It, it applies to all of them. It doesn't just apply to one. It's like a pretty fundamental thing, right? So, um, and boy, yeah. boy, when you combine this with fundamental change before. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Dan, combine this with Brexit, right? Where now um, the UK will have to go through the same. It's a. It's now going to be a transfer out of EU to the UK. So and they couldn't do it. They have a. You know, they have a. You know, millions of surveillance cameras, and um, they're a tremendous surveillance society. But I think ultimately, you know, just pragmatically, I, I think they they can't. I just don't see how they could do it. Um, you know, it, it, it's just, it, it's a wrecking ball to too many things. It creates just, uh, you know, it would just create a massive upheaval and, and no one would know what, what to do. My, my thought is that I, I think, I think I agree with you, John. I think that ultimately they will find a way to, uh, make it all work, but to create some grumblings, you know, to make it, you know, to, to make, make there be sweat without, without too much pain. But they definitely want to make you know the U.S. and other governments sweat and take them seriously. If they back down too much, then um, you know they could be ignored. So I think that a lot of it is about you know, hey, you know, we have some weight here, uh, and the biggest weight we have is that you know we can keep our data and make it hard for you to you know, move it. Uh, and so you don't want to totally um, throw away that card. Uh, so. You know, how are they going to play the card without um, without actually putting it down? Yeah, no, I agree with you there. And we'll find out next Thursday. How about that? Nice. Uh, uh, well, listen, uh, Andy, great to see you. I hope you'll join us again sometime soon. Thank you both Thank you for having me. It was fun. Uh, it was uh, terrific. Um, Dan, great to see you. I look forward to our next conversation. Yeah, and Andy, good luck with the privacy policies. I'm eager to see um, what you do. This has been a problem that I think uh, folks have been struggling with for at least 25 years, and and it's a it's a ongoing challenge. But um, I'm very eager to see what you do with it. You're um, very thoughtful about it, and uh, I'm I'm excited to, to see the results. Thanks. Yeah, and Andy, maybe well, I'll just copy yours. That'd be, that'd be <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. All right. 
Hey, good to see you all. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Take care.